some jaunty music to start off our show. I had originally wanted to do some kind of like a Hallmark moment kind of thing where I talk over the uh, music, but I used an AI writing service and it came up with some, let me just read it. Watch Thursday. What would you do if you're a genius designer, but you're suffering from depression? So rude. How, how do people react to the fake voice of Troy? With Thursday, you'll learn how to... Oh no, we lost Troy. Wow. So the AI gave him uh, audio so bad that it killed his microphone. And I don't have control of the camera, so I can't make you watch me. So uh, if you all can hear me, let me know. I might still be muted, so there might literally be nothing going on at the moment. Wow. Let me see if it looks like this is actually live. Watch live. Da, 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 da. This is the show, folks. We don't dance. Oh, I'm just not getting anything. Da, 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 da. Certainly no one is indicating that they can see or hear me. Oh, yep. Being told I'm live. Okay, then. Well, so this is going to be a strange show if uh, we don't get <clears throat> Troy back. Because uh, you guys are going to be standing at the, the placard for the show uh, where we... Last show of the year, embracing the holiday, bring a good question, uh, and any capade experience you might have to today's live stream, because I don't control that part. So until and unless <laughs> Robert Emerson says, sometimes I get that awkward feeling, like I snuck to the back of a studio without the crew knowing about it. Yeah, we're all in the back of the studio without the crew knowing about it at the moment, and I am also not getting anything from Troy by chat, so uh, he might he might have gone silent, run silent, run deep. So um, I can perfectly well do a show like this, but without Troy and without visuals and without uh, questions, it's it's going to be a lot of me just blathering. Um, so I'll begin the blather. But folks, if you've got a question uh, on any me related or Green Ronin related or... Uh, Thursday age related or fantasy age related question, just leap in and let me know what it is. Hepeth says, isn't technology wonderful? Um, one of the things that frequently happens when I am, well, I guess it hasn't happened in a long time because I haven't done it in a long time, but when I when I used to go to stores in person and check out and something would happen and the cashier would be trying to apologize to me for whatever delay it was, I would just smile and say, ah, the joys of technology. Um, because I remember growing up right the, the cashier still had a big physical device and you would you would punch the buttons into it and uh figure out the prices and it would spit out a receipt and there was no scanning no beeping no putting in product codes the thing had a sticker on it the sticker told you how much it was worth um that just means you're a wizard harry as in harry dresden oh, that's actually pretty funny um, I do famously have something of an anti-technology field. Uh, it doesn't normally reach out and hit people in other states, but I have more than one friend who's in IT. And one of the things that happened when I was starting to do things like streams and work on my computer full time is some bizarre thing would happen. And I would get them on the phone or by chat and I would say, hey, uh, I'm doing A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z is, is happening in response. And they would frequently say, no, 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 that's that's not possible. If you're doing A, B, and C, you can't get X, Y, and Z. And I, well, that's that's what I'm getting. And one of my friends uh, once came over and said, okay, show me the process. And I showed him, and he just stared. Oh, you can see me now. 
Hey, folks. You're on. <laughs> I have no clue what happened. I've I've been covering Troy. Yes, I love it. I, I've been listening to you vamp a little bit, but uh, yeah, that was that was incredibly bizarre. Um, the yeah, I, I'm not sure what people heard or didn't hear, but uh, I kind of don't want to recreate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll just we'll just say that in order to try and get what sounded like a Hallmark Christmas uh, overlay. Troy went and had a AI that is designed to do such things, generate some text using keywords. And the text was bizarre. Yeah, I can uh, read the text. I mean, if we, if you'd like, um, but yeah, it, no, read, read yeah. the text. I want people to hear this. Cause it's, it's, it's so weird. Now the, the keywords that I used were Thursday age. Uh, I did use the term Christmas miracle. Um, you know, Troy Owen disembodied, you know, all, you know, that kind of good stuff. So here's what it says. Watch Thursday. What would you do if you're, if you, if you are a genius designer, but you're suffering from depression, <laughs> that was not in there. What, how do people react to the fake voice of Troy with Thursday? You learn how to design with no worries. You'll also see the creativity behind this show. The disembodied voice of Troy, the brilliant genius of gem cutter, Owen Casey Stevens. Today, it's the opposite of a Christmas miracle. Will Troy and Owen be able to work together to get the show done on time? Troy is your friend, and Owen has a big brain. <laughs> this will show. This will be a show to remember. This is so weird. Um, and then it goes into, hey, I just wanted to say you're awesome. Taking a turn into the script, I guess. Uh, Troy is your friend, so listen, when he, listen up when he speaks. Owen Casey Stevens, the genius behind Thursday, is here to tell you why the Christmas clue will never be solved. <laughs> Starting with, we don't know what the Christmas clue is. That's right. That's right. So what do two bumbling friends do when they're given a Christmas scavenger hunt? Troy needs your help to solve the Christmas clue in time for Christmas. Will Troy and Owen solve this puzzle in time? Find out on Thursday. Who's got the teeth? That's it. <laughs> for real. It is absolutely who's got the teeth. So, you know, I think... Um, I think we're onto something. I think that the AI is onto us. And um, yeah, so Owen, um, why can't we uh, solve the Christmas clue? Yeah, I think we're going to have to start with we have no idea what the Christmas clue is. Um, I, I actually kind of like that as a line who can solve the Christmas clue. Uh, because to me, Christmas and many holidays are a bit of a riddle, right? Like <laughs> this is supposed to be the happiest time of the year and it's when i and my friends and some of my family are often the most stressed uh most subject to depression and mood swings um i'm sitting here right now staring at a really really pretty sparkly tree i got a camera i can show people <clears throat> a really really pretty sparkly tree that we had put together uh and i like it i like how it looks but it's a lot of work <laughs> And it's going to be a lot of work to take it down, and it's going to be a lot of work to take up the pine needles. And and a Christmas tree doesn't even have anything to do with any of the foundations of Christmas. So I think Christmas has become a bit of a riddle. And yeah, it, it's uh, instead of a, a normal gift exchange this year, uh, my family is going to do a Yola book and float. Come again? A Yola book and float. Oh, of course. So. Uh, that is a Yule book exchange in Norwegian. Oh, nice. Uh, we had a friend in Seattle who invited us to uh, Yule Book and Float for several years while we were living there, and we really enjoyed it. Uh, everyone brings a single wrapped book, um, preferably no game books or puzzle books or anything massively controversial or sad. Uh, you, uh, you wrap it, and you don't say what it is, but you do say a little something about you know, a hint about what kind of thing it is. Um, and then one at a time, uh, someone randomly, I think the last person that shows up picks a book uh, and then whoever's book they picked, they pick the next book and you just go through and you unwrap them and you each get a book for the holidays. Okay. Um, Do you go with a theme or is it just sort of like a, this is a great book or this is funny or you, you can go with a theme. Uh, the ones I've been to the theme tended to be, Hey, we're all geeks and we know it. Uh, with, which was never a formal theme. The one rule, because it was with so many game designers in, in Seattle and people that played games, was no game books. Because there's no way to know what game book someone would right. get that they need that they don't have. Um, 
but it, it just it's it's a nice it, it's fun it sparks conversation uh and also you know if money's tight it means that you're you're able to unwrap watch a bunch of gifts get unwrapped and you get to unwrap one yourself but at the cost of <clears throat> one book which you were specifically saying, hey, re regifting is appropriate here. If you've got a book in your library that you're done with that you want to pass on, this is a lovely time for that. Nice. I like that. So, you know, I'm thinking about, you, I've thought a lot about this. When you are a group of people who have been meeting around the table, it's a unique friendship. You know, you, may not, you may not know these people outside of that context uh, for some time. Um, and you get to know some folks, but you may not necessarily know folks. Um, you know, is, is it typical for groups that you played with to do an exchange? Yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you do? I, I mean, it depends on the group, right? Um, we have done everything ranging from, uh, hey, we're all going to bring something small and put them in a pile and see what people like uh, to Secret Santa where you have a specific person and you do a great big gift. We have moved further and further and further from great great big gifts as we get older and older and little things. Uh, th the thought really does seem to matter more and the opportunity to unwrap something. I mean, um, we didn't do a formal exchange with people this year for for our gamers, but there were still... Uh, one person brought a chocolate orange wrapped for, for each member of the group. Uh, one person brought just a gift for me, which was a, a Hydra Stomper figure, uh, which I actually Fun. have around. Hey, Chris, here. you made it right on time. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it, good to see you, I Beth. Good to see you, Robert, as yeah, well. Um, not, there we go. Cool. Um, but more and more, it's about experiences and hanging out with people. That's that's yeah. sort of, especially during the pandemic, just being able to to spend time communicating with people uh, has sort of been the magic. And we still have a small, tight social bubble, um, so we can get together in person occasionally uh, for the moment. That may change in the following weeks. We'll see what the winter brings. Good Thursday to you, Brian F. Irving. Good to see you. And uh, yeah, so, you know, we um, if you missed the first part of the show, <laughs> I, I missed it too. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but um, uh, everything reset over here on my end. But um, uh, Owen was, you know, uh, holding down the fort. We got back to share a really bizarre AI um, driven, use some keywords, use a little um, descriptive text, and then it generates text for you. And it was incredibly wild i mean just non sequitur to a degree that was like you know asking who had the teeth and uh clued in on you know just sort of just the weirdness of the holiday the emotional instability <laughs> but um you know i'm wondering i guess ai as a as a tool for writing is not going to overtake writers at any in any time in the near future like i mean uh <laughs> I don't know about the near future. It, 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 there's so many things that I thought at one time were just never going to happen. Um, and the technology is accelerating so fast. And it would not surprise me if we do get to a stage where you can have curated computer aided writing, right? So like the current system where we have freelancers and developers uh, and a freelancer writes and it gets sent to a developer and they sort of polish it up. It would not surprise me if in the next two to three years it was possible to say, okay, here's an AI and it is specifically designed to write, uh, let's say, Nancy Drew novels. And we fed it every Nancy Drew novel and we have a, a simple plot mystery mechanism put up. We press a button, it spits out a manuscript and the manuscript isn't perfect, but it's good enough that we can send it to a professional computer writing developer and then they can mm. send it to an editor and then it'll be a product. And, and so you might well cut writers out of at least some I, I think there will always be room for writers to write something new and into the but there is a lot of schlock writing out there which as someone who loves a great deal of schlock writing I mean I've, I'm a I'm a big fan of the pulps uh, I'm I have written my own schlock writing there is absolutely a market for the the one dollar PDF that's that's 50,000 words long uh, that just gives you enough that you feel like you got your dollars worth. And that I could easily see AI writing with some polish breaking into that market within a few years or right. 
20 years from now, it still might not be up to it. I, I don't know what that breakthrough will be. You know, I, I'm wondering too. Yeah. So Robert says, um, uh, I think AI writing partners are a thing to come. We're just in the weird AF learning stages uh, for those where, unlike human writers, we see the horse show that rookies put out. Yeah, you know what's interesting? They're, they're already um, there is a there's some really great AI support for you know even the nuances of like to get really into the nitty gritty of grammar and all of that kind of yeah. stuff. Like it's and they're incredibly they're incredibly helpful. Um, you know. Uh, algorithms that sort of sort out like when you're going to need to translate something. And, but I, you know, and generally speaking as a, a person who works on the internet and this is where my, where I make my money. Um, I, uh, I really think that the algorithms are a horrible, they, they do a horrible service to the, uh, to the human. And the reason I feel that way is these algorithms are created to kind of support at scale millions of people. And it presupposes that there are going to be some edge cases, but they don't care. Right. <laughs> yeah. Those edge cases are, are pretty much sort of like, no, oh, that's the price you pay when you want to try to get as many people helped as possible. And then you start seeing things like customer service venues shutting off so that you get shunted into this sort of pool of problems that are close to your problem. But yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, I, you know, I, I have a feeling that there will be, um, the backlash, I think, will be about authenticity, and people want to know, I think, that there's a human behind that so that they're having an experience that's shared with a human and not something manufactured, presupposed by a little bit of data. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Um, what have we got here? Um, oh, yeah, interesting. Um, Robert adds... Uh, I did one of those AI painting sites of a character name, nothing else. And it made a creepy yet an oddly on target image. Very interesting. I, yeah. Um, and then uh, our friend, Mr. Bodie says uh, the fans of Stargate recently used an AI to write a Stargate SG one episode that actually got the attention of the writers and actors. No kidding. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're getting, we're getting close there. Um, I, yeah, I think that as a supplement to the, to the talent, uh, certainly, I mean, that's that is a very interesting you know kind of scenario um but i i don't know i mean i think i'm probably going to be one of those uh one of those luddites in the future that are just like down with the algorithm i mean there are things there are online algorithms that super frustrate me um so youtube knows that i do research into uh world war ii and firearms and engineering and tanks and thus assumes that I have a political leaning. I absolutely do not. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, there, there's the old joke that, you know, don't, if you, if you see my browser history, don't worry. I'm, I'm not a psychopath. I'm a writer. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you, you look into things like, hey, what what poison kills people the fastest? And <laughs> how how do you build a slipknot? And how long does it take to construct a gallows? And, <laughs> right. I, and there's some just simple questions. I, I remember I was writing a scenario where at one point uh, the, the heroes are supposed to be thrown in jail and the bad guys build a gallows to hang them. And that went to editing. And the editor asked me, how long does it take to build a gallows? Because you're talking about a gallows to hang eight people. So we're talking about a platform 10 feet off the ground. It's got to be, what, 20 feet wide, 10 feet deep. You need stairs. And I was like, I have no idea. I just assumed while you were in jail, they could build a gallows. <laughs> right. I have not looked at the engineering requirements of this. Um, and it's a legit question, right? Uh, we, we actually ended up changing that adventure so that uh, there was a gallows in the middle of town when the PCs show up that they used to hang the last group. So, yes, this is someone said, is this gallows humor? <laughs> this is literally gallows humor. Uh, so that the players could see, oh, they've already got a gallows, and then they could be told, all we have to do is get some ropes and, and we'll be ready to hang you. And then the time frame didn't matter. But uh, that's the sort of stuff that I just... And, and sometimes you can tell that television shows haven't given any thought to this stuff or not. I mean, famously, oh, yeah. there's, an, there's an NCIS episode where they, they have to do some cuter work fast, so two of them get on the same keyboard. Um, <laughs> that's and, great. And I just... I, I can feel everyone that's ever dealt with a computer going, that's not how this works. That's not how <laughs> any of this works. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the sort of thing that 
you know, you gotta you gotta depend on your own suspension of disbelief when it comes to something like games and television, and and it's relevant as a as a GM and a player, right? Uh, this is a game where someone can successfully stab me with a knife seven times, and my reaction is to go, "Well, I might want to rest before we go to the next encounter." Um, <laughs> right. And, and that's just that's an accepted part of the genre uh, because it makes the game work smoothly. Right, right. So you can suspend some of this, like, okay, now you're dragging your entrails across the yeah, exactly. battlefield. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's no fun at all, and that's a yeah. Um, but when it comes to realism, <clears throat> excuse me. When it comes to realism um, and and getting that kind of, you know, I'm, I'm curious from the folks who are in chat as well. Um, what, where, where are your, where's your go-to kind of resource for research? Is it literally just Google or do you have like something that you always kind of go to as a, as a sort of touchstone for process and things? <laughs> this is great. One of my reoccurring searches back in the day of running champions was damage caused by an average nuclear bomb. <laughs> and then you got to start by defining what is an average nuclear bomb. Yeah, totally. When I was working on uh, the arms and equipment guide for the Star Wars role playing game with Jeff Grubb, uh, one of the things that we wanted to put in it was assassin droids because they show up in the expanded universe all the time. And there's IG 88, which is an assassin droid, which is an empire. So we were going through. Uh, and I was already in Oklahoma, having left uh, Wizards of the Coast, and he was still out in Seattle. And, uh, yeah, Dark Sun, so yeah, Liz is right. Uh, go to the bookshelf, then to Wikipedia. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, and so we were selecting what we thought was a good cross-section of assassin droids. And I looked at our pricing and realized that we only had super high-end expensive ones. So lower-level characters, there was nothing there for them either to fight or to buy. And so I sent an email to uh jeff that just said jeff i think we may have picked the wrong assassins some of these are too expensive <laughs> and then That's i immediately great. sent another email that copied that and said uh by the way dear fbi uh security van i mean when writing <laughs> assassin droids for this star wars book that you'll see has actually been announced with our names on it i think we have selected too many expensive fictional assassin droids right for this fictional setting we're not actually trying to kill someone on the cheap right no absolutely yeah and and that is uh yeah and i've had the same kind of thing you know especially when it comes to learning specific things about a game um you know and having to type in just the most ludicrous stuff the other thing that i find just at least in my slice of this of this work is that i'm oftentimes i'm oftentimes called to parse through the statements or the posts or emails and things that people send and those are sometimes pretty spicy <laughs> <laughs> and so to forward that stuff around, sometimes um, I do remember working on a, a video game. Uh, I worked on with uh, Chris uh, Primus on uh, Pirates of the Burning Sea. And one of our, you know, community folks that had, you know, all the answers, uh, as, you know, many players can, uh, sent in a... Um, uh, sent in a screed, but I had gotten to a point where I can, I just filter out all of that, the sort of pejorative <laughs> and invective and all of that stuff. And, um, and uh, all the ad hominem and you just, I just kind of like, you know, dismiss it. And at the kernel of all that, it was some actual real great feedback. And I thought, Oh, okay. Well, you know, I mean, sure. This guy's being a jerk, but I, this is a good, this is good feedback. If you can get through it, I'll just send it to the designer. I didn't think to just grab the good stuff. I just sent the whole thing over and, and I didn't think anything of it. And he walks into my office later and says, uh, that's it. I'm done. I'm, I, I can't deal with these people. I can't deal with the players are the worst and players. Are the, so we just had this kind of lengthy talk about like, at what point do you sort of know that, hostility from a player is just sometimes an expected situation and how to filter that stuff out, but it can be difficult. I mean, yeah. I mean, whether it's because you're looking up how to poison people or because, you know, you've got a player who's being a jerk and you're looking up how to poison people, you know, either way it's um, you can end up with some spicy language to share um, when it comes to, um, so uh, folks are talking about um, research topic stuff, you know, Google I've, is it just me or has Google become less useful? 
Uh, I think Google regularly changes how it weighs different things. And part of that is because people engage in, in search engine optimization, right? So people are trying to figure out how to trick the automated system of Google uh, yeah. to go to their site, regardless of what someone is looking for. And like when I'm looking at stock art, I, I have the same issue. I will sometimes say, hey, I want a uh, uh, guard with gun. And I get a picture of a bunny rabbit. And I'm like, I have no idea what keywords you put in this piece of art, but there's no guard. There's no gun. There's, there's nothing yeah. even vaguely similar. Um, but I do find that... Uh, if you you like any tool, if you're using it on a regular basis, when it changes, you can adapt to it. I still find Google to be extremely useful, but I have learned that I have to put certain parts in quotes, and I may need to to do some Boolean searches that say you know and this minus that. Uh, right, right. And there are there are resources out there to help teach you how to use Google. Um, so it's uh, <laughs> that's that. <laughs> Google's average one core update a month in 2021. It's making the SEO department at my marketing agency nuts. What um, they expect out of people for SEO. And, and I mean, it is just compounded the work. It's no longer just a blog post. It is a, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that goes into it. Every tweet, every whatever. So yeah, that's uh oh, I like Wikimedia too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It is a great resource for art. Absolutely. Oh, you know what? I think I might have said this on the program before. A great resource for weird art, and this is my gift, my Christmas gift to everybody, is um, old patents. Oh, oh, that's they come, great. They come with little illustrations, and yeah. they are wild. They're just wild. So you can pretty much find anything, and uh, you know whether it's you're trying to do some kind of steampunky thing or some kind of future tech or whatever, but you can go back into the archives. Uh, just go to the library check them out i mean like it's really it's really fun and uh you can end up making some pretty interesting additions to that we should actually uh, publish a a uh, a weird objects book of found you know stuff i'm looking at uh let's see checking out best comment here um oh this is great yeah one time my co-writer and I were killing time at a fast food place near Times Square discussing plots. Then we realized we hadn't mentioned anything like book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, it is good that, you know, uh, uh, she concludes with that it was good that it was before 9-11. But um, yeah, yeah. Totally. New, New Yorkers would be uh, definitely like, what? <laughs> um, okay, well, so let's see. Um I got to tell you, um, uh, our friend David Bodie says, uh, I sometimes use Pinterest to do character art searches. If you haven't checked out um, our Pinterest, um, I think it's uh, I'm Ronan Troy. Go check it out because we've got there's so much art from uh, from the book, so much art from, you know, uh, from our site. It's uh, there's a ton of stuff going on there. There's some people with some phenomenal collections of absolutely. Uh, yeah, of reference stuff. Um, now, Liz says Smithsonian has open access resources too. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, Smithsonian and, and for that matter, NASA has released a whole lot of imagery that is available for the, the public use. Very cool. Okay, so, you know, one of the things that people do get a little confused about sometimes, you know, so we're, we're in the world of VTT now. We've got, um, you know, we, we just released uh, Modern Age content, of course, The Expanse on uh, Foundry and on Roll20, and um, we're gearing up for more age products. And, um, you know, of course, the big question now is, do we do, this is the big question on the mind of the community, is it three in one? So you have one character sheet and you've got, uh, you can kind of just flip a switch and it turns, or do you do individual ones? And I'm leaning towards individual just because of the complexity of it all. But um, there are a lot of people that borrow art, just kind of snag it yeah. off of the internet. Um, and that's a tricky bit of business. It, it entirely is. Um, I remember talking to, and I, I won't name drop him because it's it, it's embarrassing for them but there was someone who was starting a game business that a lot of people have now heard of it's been around for a decade or more uh and was putting together his first things and literally thought that if it was on google it was public domain uh and that's not the case 
No, um, it isn't. So yeah. he, he used a bunch of art that he didn't have the rights to. And one of the artists contacted him and said, um, so this, I think, I think Liz, uh, I think Dark Sun Studios is trying to send us the link. And the link I think you are. Yeah. I'm not sure why it's not letting you, but, uh, oh, you're over on, uh, over on the Twitch. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's why. Um, Liz, send me the link. I'll send it to Troy. Uh, send it to me like by a Twitter or Facebook. I'll send it to Troy. We'll get it up. Yeah. We'll, we'll share. Um, but anyway, so uh, one of the artists contacted him and said, you know, you're, you, you can't use this stuff uh, and explained it to them. And they were terribly embarrassed and, you know, gave the artist, I think it was 150 bucks because they felt bad. And, and that made it all go away and stopped using the art. But uh, I, I don't I don't try to tell people when they're doing their personal blogs that are not for profit. Uh, I don't want to constantly go after them and tell them, hey. Uh, you can't use that piece of art you, you, just because you're talking about it. fair use doesn't mean that you get to use it uh, anywhere you want to. Right. Um, and royalty free doesn't mean it's free. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Um, royalty free can just mean that you're, you're pay like I use a lot for my personal products. I use a lot of Adobe stock art um, and that is royalty free, but I have to pay a fee to right. use the stock art. That's right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you got to read that for the, the, you know, there are, no end of services that are like that actually do. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, oh. Was that it? That, that still okay. has that, that, that has all the stuff that Facebook has to it. So give me a second. Oh, the crufty. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Facebook. Um, but yeah, so um, interestingly enough, there is, um, you know, there, there are a lot of resources out there for people who want to put, you know, kind of utilize art and stuff, but I have, I have not necessarily outside of like, um, you know, uh, drive through RPG, uh, which is, you know, we've got our, our program where you can, um, the age creators Alliance, and you can kind of, and there's even sort of the, um, powered by, uh, M&M, um, uh, stuff. So you can get in and write some stuff. Where do people go to get inspiration on writing, training and that kind of stuff? Like what's the, uh, I'm not sure that there are necessarily, uh, Liz points out that Rogue Genius has stock art, including some from hers. Yes, of course, I should mention that Rogue Genius Games over on Drive Through has lots of stock art from people like like Liz Quartz and Jacob Blackman. And hey, uh, cool. again, it is it is royalty free, but not free. So you you pay us a fee, and then you can use it uh, for your projects. Um, so I think a lot of different people have different uh, places that they go for inspiration. I've now put in the links and when I take out the Facebook ID, it doesn't work. So just go ahead and put them there with it. We'll oh, yeah, it worked for me. Yeah, I okay. got there. Well, we'll give Facebook its pound of flesh. Um, yeah. So uh, I personally, I mean, it's one of the things that I find things like this podcast useful for there. You know, like I, I will listen to Mutants and Masterminds Monday, uh, not so much because I am running or playing in a Mutants and Masterminds game at the moment, but because... Uh, Alex and Steve and and Crystal are brilliant and veteran <clears throat> and experienced in the field, and I, I can't listen to that show without getting inspired or some useful tip that I would not have picked up otherwise. Ooh, so, this is cool. Uh, that is solid. Yeah, it is cool. That is solidly amongst the stuff that I look to for inspiration and to to sort of hone and polish elements of my craft. Yeah, I just kind of clipped into the Angels and Demons. It's got a little menu here. Fantastic space. Oh wow, this is great. Yeah, so we'll we'll get these links up. Uh, however, Troy wants. Thank to do you, this. Stan. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> you heard me. You heard me going. <clears throat> uh, no, I don't even pretend. Um, but um, you know that also reminds me. There is a library of. Um, uh, public domain art. Yes, you just have to be tricky. You got to be careful with it. Public domain art can be tricky uh, because you have to be sure it's in the public domain. Like there's a whole range of art that might be in the public domain unless someone filed to extend the copyright on it. There's a, a range of years. Uh, 
I noticed Owen not noticing your ads. <laughs> um, and sometimes people will put together uh, websites that are like, hey, here's a bunch of public domain art, but you got to see if those are people that you can trust to be right that the art is public domain. So I like to try and track public domain art down to its original source, even if I'm using it from somewhere else. So I can say definitely, okay, this art is from 1912. It's definitely in the public domain. Uh, this art is from... Uh, <laughs> 1930 something it may be in the public domain and i got to figure out exactly but public domain art can be great absolutely you know there's a lot of very interesting stuff so wikimedia commons of course is great um yeah. but uh you know liz had me inspired to check out some of the other uh museums and national gallery of art um moma uh just a bunch of these you know very well known uh, museums they have open access images that you can yeah. just download and use they they're just like you may use this and there are f over fifty thousand images so yeah that'd be a fun a fun library to dig through um for sure i like it um so okay um and you i i, I will be honest um that's true you know i mean and rarely does uh you know disney doesn't really f anything up um you know they've <laughs> They they're pretty committed to overturning public domain and and protecting dis you know the Mickey and and friends from yeah I'm I'm pretty sure that Disney is not going to try and extend copyright protection again even though the very first Steamboat Willie uh, is moving towards being in public domain I am pretty sure that they're going to accept <laughs> that that is simply going to happen this time and then lean hard on the fact that even when he, the art is in public domain that Mickey Mouse and his image are trademarks and to try and use trademark protection to prevent anyone from doing anything that would be recognizably Disney related, even though the, the images and uh, script from Steamboat Willie will be available to everyone. And it's just, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes down. Yeah. Yeah. It will be interesting to see. And I'm, you know, they, they've been, <laughs> Pretty diligent. I, I wonder if that is the case because I think it also they take a pretty strong PR hit when they decide to kind of thwart this classic thing. Um, let's see. Mr. Bodie says doo -doo -doo -doo. we need to remember that even though some materials might be free or public domain, you still have to list the materials in your license and trademark documents. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that that depends, right? If something is actually in the public domain, I don't. I don't have to, uh, unless I have a a license or trademark uh, that that is dependent on it. Right. 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 Um, so if if I find a public domain image uh, that is a picture of a rock, it's in the public domain. I can use it however I want to. Um, but uh, the fact that it is public domain, for instance, means if I try to build a trademark on it, that trademark may not be enforceable because I'm using a public domain image. Um, it's it's going to be really interesting. I think that Disney has realized that the public domain hits that they've taken in the past will pale in comparison now that the internet will unite people and be able to, to sure. send words everywhere. So, yeah, 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 and uh, yeah, that's interesting. So they've been buying up a lot of IP. There's a lot of companies out there buying up a lot of IP right now, uh, consolidating all that stuff under one, even in the tabletop role play space. Yeah. Uh, so Liz points out that uh, images.nasa.gov has the oh, NASA nice. image radio library. Yeah. I'm going to uh, I'm going to show that real fast. It is. Uh, this is cool. Yeah. Very very cool. So I'm going to search for Owen. <laughs> <laughs> You shouldn't find anything. Your home planet enlisted in the database? Uh, so, I mean, my home planet is because it's Earth, but... Mm, uh, yes, it, right. I'm sorry. Yes, of course it is. It it, it doesn't mention me uh, all specifically. Um, oops, Orion. I did not. Well, I mean, I'm looking here at the... Uh, 
the title that you put for this episode on the restream, and it says Thursday with own Casey Stevens. It it was what I typed the first time I put it out there, and and uh, uh, I tried to fix it, but I couldn't fix it there. I couldn't get to it. I want O R I O N, and I mean I can't complain when I when I was at the very first Green Renin Summit I was ever invited to, which I believe was 2014. Um, mm-hmm. I was passing out my Rogue Genius business cards, and uh, Joe Carricker said, "Oh." I didn't know that there was uh, only one E in your last name. And I was like, what? And so I, on funny. the business cards that I'd been passing out for years, it said S T E P H N S. So I had a typo of my own name on my own business cards. That's that right. That I'd used for years without noticing. That is the, just the best. Yeah. The, the phone number was right. The email address was right. All of those things were there. Is it in the public domain? Oh. You know, what it says to me is that um, we do all own a bit of own, um, but uh, uh, I mean, at least, you know, intellectually, um, and we don't own it so much as we cherish it as gifts when you share your ideas and then we take them uh, and present them as our own. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I see the the business card thing as being something more along the lines of you are um, not particularly prone to... Um, elaborate shows of you know self-importance <laughs> you know like i you are a very down-to-earth individual so i could see just glossing over your name because it's your name like yeah, everyone knows who you are and uh you know so i i don't know that it is so much a a, a um a call out of your <laughs> attention to detail <laughs> more so maybe not so much your tooting of your own horn um we all need editors oh yeah that's true um Let's see. David Bodhi says, uh, we all need editors. My wife and I sent out save the date cards for our wedding. And it appeared that I didn't know how to spell Arkansas. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. It, depending on if your in-laws were living there or if you were li- <laughs> that, like, <laughs> can cause a lot of trouble um, for sure. Um, I uh, would always do this. Um, I would send out um, uh, requests for you know developers that actually weren't even maybe even the same state as me. Maybe they're working on the game and they're uh, over at a different studio. And I'd say, could you please get, uh, send me four to five screenshots? I really need to see <laughs> these and I need them quick. Um, yeah, I wanted screenshots actually. And I never really got any screenshots, thankfully, but I did get a lot of shit for saying that or typing that. Um, all right. So I, I kind of dig this, um, this sort of resources to build your own, roll your own stuff. Um, we've talked about art. We kind of, we didn't really touch on sort of inspirations for writing, but I mean, I, you know, what can you do? I mean, call your friends and. Well, I mean, I, (laughs) my best inspiration for. Uh, plots and monsters and encounters is bad movies. The oh, worse, yeah. the better. Because <clears throat> when I watch a, a good movie and there's something like, you know, Indiana Jones running from the giant boulder, I want to, I want to recreate that moment and everyone will recognize it. Um, but when I watch really, really bad movies, I end up going, no, that's a terrible idea. And my brain will immediately fill in. It would have been so much better if. So seeing the bad takes on things causes my brain to put a twist on it that makes it, at least in my opinion, more interesting. And the original source is not as well known as a a really good movie or television show. So uh, it is not unusual for me to, for example, pick some uh, MST3 Cray or Rift Tracks versions of movies. Oh, sure. Uh, Yeah. There are also some movies that that you can get on uh, Prime that specifically talk in some length about, you know, the original from the 1954 classic. Um, (laughs) And they're often really, really, really bad. But that can that can really inspire me. You know, one of the things that I think uh, has changed a bit is I feel as though uh, interaction on the Internet back in the day back when you and I were just spring chickens back in the day, it was a little more long form, a little bit more lengthy in the exchange, like on forums and things. Um, yeah. It's not as prevalent. Well, so I think it, it started to go away and then I think it's starting to come back. Um, I've seen a fair amount of link long form communication on discord specifically, for example. Uh, and Paizo still has their message boards 
which can have some very long form communication. And they've been around uh, for a long time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, they, they have now. Um, but, uh, I think the fact that Facebook tends to choke things back if people don't interact with them, and therefore the longer it is, the less people are likely to interact with it. And Twitter, which just encouraged everyone to choke down <laughs> to under 300 characters, uh, caused a lot of people to go shorter and quicker on their communications. Um, but I also think they may have saved the art of writing. <clears throat> oh, really? Because yeah, because when I was coming out of high school, pre-non-college uh, internet, um, a lot of the people I graduated with were like, you know, I'm never going to have to write anything. Everything will be done on phones or by forms or in person. Yeah. And then some lawyer will write it and will sign it, and that'll be the end of the matter. Right. Uh, and I, I think the fact that you know, people were not mostly sending each other letters anymore. Phone rates were getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And even long distance was, I mean, it, it still cost by the minute, but it was something you could afford to do. And, and uh, FedEx was doing quick package delivery. Um, and then the internet suddenly made communicating by typing far, far, far more common. And I think That's it, right. it, it made people want to be able to do it uh, and kept them, in the habit of doing it, which I think was the most important part. So, Owen, I've got a question for you. So we're talking about the internet resources therein, and and oftentimes people will look at you know. So Twitter's got a character limit. Um, you know, the the algorithm is at play at all times. Um, when you think of venues like um, the uh, like TikTok, what I are you familiar with that vaguely? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, your videos can be up to three minutes long and, and then you can also do a live broadcast and you can have a couple people on with you. Uh, here's my question to you. This was a, a challenge put to me by uh, Crystal Frazier, whom I, I've been racking my brain. I've, I've been talking to people who are on TikTok and the tabletop role play space. How would you do an adventure wherein people have three minutes that like it's all done on TikTok, and you have three minutes to communicate the thing and then it sets in motion some stuff like i mean you know or what we can turn it on its head as well if you've got some kind of other notion but you know that's the tool we have to work with how do we make tabletop role play cohesive in that with that as the restriction so there are there are two tacks i can see taking uh, one would be to get some hysterical people that are good at coming up with one-liners, film a 45-minute to two-hour uh, session with just a tight number of encounters, and then edit it down to three minutes of spit takes. Um, and <laughs> for an example of what that might look like, uh, there's a guy named uh, Dylan Hollis who does cooking videos. He does other stuff on TikTok, but he does cooking videos where he lays things out at the beginning. He's like, and 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 he cooks bizarre sounding recipes from old cookbooks, right? So oh, I love him. Like, yes. So he'll do something like a water pie from 1924. I remember that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he will give a very short setup, so he tells you what it is. Uh, what it looks like, and then he takes you through the process, but at two or three seconds per, right? So I could see doing the video with, you know, uh, into the goblin pyromaniac camp, a two-hour <laughs> adventure. <laughs> <coughs> and then you just, you, you lay out your first set piece, and you do, entrance, ambush, <laughs> roll to five, and you just break things down like that and put it together. Um, that would take a lot of work because a whole lot do, of work you'd have to do the actual short encounter uh, and then edit it down to be super short the other thing i could see doing would be to instead use tiktok as a jumping off point so for example uh you could say okay we are going to run a a modern age game and in the modern age game, people are picking up a strange alien broadcast that suggests something creepy is going on. Mm -hmm. And we make the actual TikTok video and we put out the adventure. And in the adventure, we say, hey, you can just read the description of this. Or here's the URL to go to TikTok and show your players the actual video. 
Interesting. Okay. And so one of the things that we were playing around with uh, in, in my mind, I was just sort of bouncing it back and forth is the, you know, the, a lot of people still do some of the play by email uh-huh. kind of, you know, kind of stuff. And I thought like, what if there was a, a time frame like we are playing now and you have your three minutes to set up your whatever and you're talking about it and then the party can react to your three minutes of or two minutes of you know um it, it will be some weird sort of uh you know this jumping back and forth a little time you know a little more time but you know as a as a person watching tiktok you could pretty much get into the flow of it and sort of see where it ended up with the you know, the GM acting as an arbiter and, and sharing some guidance and, you know, saying, oh, you didn't make it or you did or this happened. You know, now I, I suddenly kind of want to make an adventure where all the read aloud text is available as TikTok videos. So mm. we used to joke uh, that there are certain game designers that their games are really genius things, but it sort of takes that game designer to run you through it. Um, or that game designer does a better job. Uh, but I could see, like, I, I played a single uh, part of one encounter uh, with Gary Gygax in the 90s uh, at Gen Con. Yeah. And his eyes would just light up as he was getting into these really fascinating descriptions of what was going on. And he could do the voices and everything. Uh, and I thought, you know, this was ultimately just an attack by talking dire wolves uh, at night. That's all it was. But but he made <laughs> it feel like a lot more than that. And there have been a lot of GMs in my life that can do that. And some people talk about, you know, not wanting to do the funny voices or whatever. I could easily see taking an adventure and saying, okay, uh, pl- play that is this descriptive text. And we just have a really good GM say whatever it is that we have written. But he yeah. runs you through it as if he was there. And then... The, the the in-person GN runs you through the adventure until you get to the next section where they, okay, click here, oh, here on this board. Uh, you see a dark cavern ahead. There's a faint smell of sulfur. It's, it, you know, whatever it is that we've got. Right, I yeah. Just make those as, as available optional aids for internet-enabled players and GMs. Wow, that is very interesting. And I do like that it kind of lends a little more relevance to the, to the TikTok venue. I mean... How fun, um, you know, I, I definitely, um, let's see, we've got a, Stan says uh, you could do a version of Hickman's Killer Breakfast as a series of live TikTok vids. What's uh, Hickman's Killer Breakfast? Uh, so that's a famous Gen Con event uh, where Tracy Hickman uh, kills off characters <laughs> uh, early in, on, I think, Saturday morning, or really it might be Sunday morning. But uh, I could easily, and, and they die in, in interesting and spectacular ways. So you you certainly could like do a series of, like, let's say that you were uh, running uh, Tome of Horrors, uh, Tomb of Horrors, which uh, Malcolm actually did at OrcaCon a few years ago. And obviously, if you're running uh, Tomb of Horrors in, in first or second edition, there's a chance that there's going to be a lot of, of dying. And so you could just <laughs> say, you know, have every time someone dies, you we do a video where you cut to the GM and, and he says, Do you enter the face? Player. Well, I stick my arm in it to see if I can find anything in the darkness. GM. Blood starts spewing from your stump of an arm. <laughs> Go back to player. <laughs> and then the player falls over sideways. Um so Yeah, there, I can see that. Yeah, there there are ways we could do it if if we wanted to put into the effort. Uh, you know, I, I really do want to put in the effort. I mean, I, I think that there's a way that maybe somewhere between super heavy lifting and sort of the normal course of a, uh, of a, you know, if you were going to spend, geez, five hours, five months, five years uh, on a campaign with folks, um, I could see there being a beat of time where you need to sort of... Um, like there needs to be some kind of mechanism that says, okay, you know, the barbarian has not responded. <laughs> Clearly they, it's dinner time or something, happened, you know, so we will jump over to the next door. You know, it's some kind of mechanism as that goes. But uh, uh, David, I'm wondering, so you said there's some board games that come with a tablet app. And so the idea then is that you, you would use the tablet app as a, as a way of um, like playing long distance and doing video um, kind of interaction. Uh, I would love an insight into that just because I think that there, I, I really want to do this one. I, I really want to figure out a, um, the perfect TikTok 
um, you know, and utilizing uh, the adventure game engine in some capacity uh, and make it so that it becomes sort of a fun thing that anybody can do, you know, to kind of add water and, and just get out there and, and do some uh, tabletop role playing without the table. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I send this out to the world as well. If you come across a thought or an idea, um, of course, you know, if you are doing something like that or you want to don't not do it because, because <laughs> you heard it here first, like go in and have some, uh, oh, yeah. oh, interesting XCOM. Okay. Um, Robert shares that it's, uh, XCOM does that amazingly. So same with Apocrypha. I'll have to check that out. I'll have to check that out. It, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, there's just so many venues. Um, oh, fun. Okay. All right. So it's like a narrator app, Matt. You know, yeah. it reminds me of there's an old game um, that was called Atmosphere, Atmos, and then it was spelled fear, huh. like fear. And it had yes. a guy saying, yeah, yes. you had a little tape, you put it in and, and it would tell you kind of how you die and um, yeah, very creepy and all that. I found the, or- <laughs> the original voice, um, all the... Uh, recordings online and they are just pretty creepy the tablet app is used locally it tells you how to set up the map pieces and then does a turn-based random event thing um call of cthulhu type board game okay great and then mansions of madness yeah okay yeah i'll have to check that out i love that i love that um good yeah brian says he uh, he remembers uh atmosphere that's right atmosphere I just remember the guy. I feel like he had a, like an Australian accent, but he'd be like, "I'm waving you goodbye." <laughs> it's <just> sort of <laughs> weird. Um, okay, so um, same challenge, but Twitter. Uh, I mean, Twitter. You could actually do turn-based gaming, right? So you you could do a running comment stream. Um, also, you know, Twitter supports videos, so you could certainly put links to videos on things. Um, when I'm using Twitter for gaming related things, I tend to just use it for, for shooting out short, compact idea generators. Right. I love uh, that. So I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I will do things like, uh, here's a, here's a 200 character description of a, a street level superhero idea I had, or, uh, Ooh. uh, here's, here's a, I, I do game night quotes, uh, on Twitter. Like last night, um, so last night we had people over and at uh, like 1130 at night, we started talking about the old days when someone would just say, hey, make first level characters, I'll run a game. And we were all having a massive wave of nostalgia. And then someone said, well, I'm I'm not running. I don't have to work tomorrow. I'll, I'll run a game, make first level characters. Um, and so I had a series of game night quotes that were just random. But the, the ones that would remind me the best were the, the timed... Uh, 11.30 a.m. You're going to run a game? I can play for a little while. 1.30 a.m. This is so much fun. Anyone got any Advil? 2.30 a.m. No, I can't drink anymore. Indigestion. 3.30 a.m. Ow, my bunions. Um, because <laughs> these were things people said as it got later and later and later. And we remembered why, as 50-year-olds plus, we don't do this anymore. Right, right. Um, hey, Brian, uh, Brian, real quick, I just want to say, I think you're right. I think I I, it, it, I believe it was South African. I mean, I think you're right. Um, and then Jonesy brings up Alice is Missing, and I've got that. I just have yet to uh, uh, to dive into it yet. But um, there yeah. was a Kickstarter I backed. but uh, And people love it. Uh, Alice is Missing. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, okay, well, so uh, we are, I can't believe we're five minutes away. We're hitting the good stuff. Um, you know, everybody's got so much going on and uh, and the the idea of the, you know, adventure by TikTok or adventure, you know, I, I think that as an exercise in, in utilizing um, social media technology in a way that is unusual and unique, I think is great. I, I definitely love bringing sort of the, you know, the, the established aesthetic of tabletop role play into a fresh kind of space to kind of int- introduce more people into it. And, uh, and so I'm going to be on the hunt. So if people find anything that, you know, sort of, uh, um, that even adjacent to this storytelling that happens that, that is particularly interesting, uh, on TikTok or I've not seen a lot of this on Twitter. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, you're, I, I, you know, of course I, I hang on every tweet that you tweet, uh, but I love your kind of, you, you sort of talk about these low level 
street toughs, you know, and, and kind of, uh, kind of tongue in cheek and camp and, and it's super fun. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you've got, if anybody has a line on other things like that, or you uh, come across a resource that you think is great, uh, send us a note, send a note to let's play at green Uh, this is the last show of the year. So we will be going into hibernation. Um, we will be, uh, consuming massive piles of cheese as, uh, a oh, Ronin yeah. is wont to do. And then, um, we will, uh, be back in, um, January and, uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm in looking into January. I think that there's going to be a lot of fun stuff cooking. Um, you know, we we might do a little refresh of the show in a, in a sense and and uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that we can add to kind of make it more crunchy. I know people love that. They love game theory. They love figuring that kind of stuff out. And, and um, you know, and, and also I, I, I feel like, oh, and I feel like you miss, um, hey, Owen, stat this. I think that's a feature <laughs> that you really, really miss. Uh, it is, it is a feature I think, uh, is popular and useful to viewers. So, uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm not prepared to say I miss it, but I, I do think it might be time for a return. Okay. And we'll, we'll kind of adjust it so that it's maybe not quite as, uh, uh the goal may not be necessarily to flap you. Um, but, uh, uh, I like that. So there's a Twitter account that spits out random maps every few hours. Wow. Uncharted yeah. Atlas. We'll have to check that out. Thank you, David. That's awesome. Um, and yes, Liz, you know, uh, cheese is the green running way. It is the green running way. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so, Brian, yeah, uh, and this is really what it boils down to. You know, we, we're going to do interactive fiction stuff, um, uh, but time is challenging. You know, uh, we'll noodle on this. Let's marinate on it. And if, uh, you know, if the time comes and someone's got a great idea and you need some people to kind of help out for a, a spell or help write some stuff or talk about some stuff, uh, let us know and I'll do the same. And uh, I would love to have our chat all, you know, kind of participating in some kind of a uh, uh, fantasy age adventure, you know, online. I gotta say, uh, yeah. you reminded me of something that Robin D laws, who's one of the, the people that I will always be learning from, uh, did way back in the day, like more than a decade ago, uh, on his blog, he had a play by blog called angels and operators. And people might want to look it up because what he literally did was, he would write about what the main character was doing, but the main character was hearing voices in his head. And then we would play the voices in his head in the comments and vote on what he was going to do. And oh, then Robin wow. Would have the, then, then Robin would describe what happens when he takes whatever the most popular action was. And then we, the voices in his head, i.e. the commentators, would discuss what the smart thing to do was next. Wow, that's cool. I really like that. I think that, you know, and I do believe that of all the things that are going on out there, even this, you know, uncharted Atlas, um, that there could be a fun awareness raising and engagement sort of piece where people can easily on board and have some fun in as part of this, you know, narrative building kind of thing. And that, uh, example that you, uh, what did you say? Angels and angels and operators was the name of the, the game. I have to see if it's still, uh, uh, out there in the internet, uh, the internet never forgets. Um, but sometimes it does. Uh, Owen, uh, this has been a remarkable year. It has been wild. It has been, um, you know, it's been a lot of things. But one thing is for sure that Thursday has been just a blast. I think it's been a blast for the people who have been, who hang out with us and chat. Um, I think that it is one of those moments um, that are just very special. And uh, you are a, um, you know, you are the brains behind Thursday, um, as as the AI rightly pointed out. But uh, I just really, uh, I think we, all of us kind of owe you a debt of gratitude for sharing uh, so much of yourself in this hour bit of time. And, you know, that's a lot of time when you look at it over the span of a year, because we're doing a lot of, well, a lot, but we're doing some work outside of, you know, the show itself. Um, but you're a real delight to work with a, a true, a true uh, collaborator. And uh, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing kind of what we do next year. Um, so yeah, the, thanks for an awesome year of Thursday. Thank you, Troy. And I just yeah. have one, one question to leave you with. Mm -hmm. Who has the teeth? <laughs> who has the teeth? Indeed. If you know who has the teeth, you'll probably want to send a note to let's play at greenronin.com because we don't know.
Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. I hope your holidays are exactly as you hope them to be um, and that you get some recharged batteries. And we'll see you in the new year with uh, with some, you know, uh, uh, fresh, uh, fun uh, um, additions to Thursday. But uh, hopefully you'll be there with us. Uh, It's been a phenomenal year and you all have been a big part of it. Thanks so much. Um, We'll see you later. Bye. Bye, folks.